just one minute. Uh, a recognized immune factor involved in the process of immune regulation. So T and B lymphocytes, neuroendocrine tissue, anti-idiotypic antibodies, T helper one and T helper two cytokines, antigen. So um, do you guys know anti-idiotypic antibodies? Would anyone like to try and define them? Um, try, you can wrong, no problem. <laughs> But basically, I want us to go fast because we have so many questions that we need to explain. So let me just define that. Um, the basically, just a moment. Um, the basically antibodies that compete with antigens for the antigen binding site. So let's say you have a B cell here, and a B cell has a B lymphocyte has a B cell receptor, right? That's where the antigen is supposed to bind. So there comes an antibody that binds to that BCR. So that becomes an anti-idiotypic antibody because it's binding where the antigen is supposed to bind. So yeah, that's an that's a process that's used in immunoregulation together with neuroendocrine tissue, T helper one and T helper two cytokines, and TMB lymphocytes. Actually, all this is in the notes for immune regulation they've been listed there so i feel like antigens are not used in immune regulation let me stimulate an immune response but do they really regulate immune responses i don't know i went with antigens yeah So, yeah, number oh, number 29. B, um, let me see. Yeah, neuroendocrine tissue that the uh, involved. Let me actually get it for you from the notes. Let me just... I don't know. Should I send it? How do you guys go about it? Should I send it to the group chat or? Yes, um, I think you can send it on the group and then people can see that. Yeah. Okay. Craft rejection is caused by um, either platelet, CD8, lymphocytes, preformed antibodies, uh, circulating immune complexes, CD4 lymphocytes. Yeah, you're right. You guys are right. It's preformed antibodies. Um, we can briefly discuss graft rejection so that we finish with that topic, right? So I like to put it in table form. I'm going to ask you guys to please help me. So let's start with hyperacute, acute, then chronic. Um, we start with time taken. So for hyperacute, how long does it take? Occurs in how long, basically? Yeah, minutes, right? Minutes, a uh, very short time. And then acute. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's mostly weeks, days or weeks. Let's go with days or weeks. Yeah. And chronic. Yeah, years, months to years. Yes, thank you. So, so we're done with time. And mediators, mediator for hyperacute, we've already said it's the preformed antibodies. Mediator for acute rejection. Yeah, T cells. Could you specify which ones? Cytotoxic. T cells. Then chronic, actually CD8.
uh, chronic. For chronic, I feel like there's confusion here, but basically what we were told is that it can involve both cell-mediated and antibody-mediated. So ADCC, antibody-dependent cell cellular cytotoxicity, and complement can be involved, and also T cells can be involved. Yeah, and then um, another thing I'd like to differentiate between acute, hyperacute, and chronic now. Hyperacute, what does it do to the cell? It causes, what does it do to the graft? It causes thrombosis and uh, ischemic necrosis of the transplant tissue. And in chronic, it causes fibrosis. The mechanism behind fibrosis is because when you involve the T cells, they react against the graft antigens, and then you produce cytokines. These cytokines, they stimulate activities of fibroblasts and kinavascular smooth muscles in muscle cell in the grafts, thus fibrosis occurs. So remember in acute, there is ischemic necrosis and thrombosis, but in chronic, it's fibrosis. Yeah, I think we've covered that topic. Uh, so there, 29 OC. We go to 31. Uh, the following is true of the BCG vaccine. It's a live attenuated vaccine, conjugate vaccine, recombinant, polyvalent, subunit. Is there anyone who'd like to? Yes, thank you. A live attenuated vaccines. So we can describe the other vaccines. Uh, basically, what's a live attenuated vaccine? What do you mean by a live attenuated vaccine? Yeah, it's basically pro uh, produced by weakening a live vaccine. So you remove its disease causing ability. Yeah, uh, conjugate vaccine, conjugate conjugation, adding something to something. Okay, because of time. Okay. Yeah, made by attaching an antigen to a carrier protein. Most of the time, this antigen is usually a polysaccharide organism and it's added to a carrier protein. So like, can you give examples of conjugate vaccines? Now, because we've talked about even the polysaccharide organism, basically encapsulated bacteria. Mm -hmm. Encapsulated bacteria, yeah, pneumococcal, meningococcal, those type of vaccines, the conjugate vaccines. And actually, that was a question, Sam. I can't remember which paper, but it was there. And then, live attenuated, you never even give other examples. Kuna BCG, yellow fever, MMR, uh, Sabine, poliovirus, oral poliovirus vaccine. Yeah, then recombinant, someone who is defined recombinant vaccine. Yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's basically genetically modifying an non-infectious pathogen to carry a part of the target pathogen so that it replicates it. Yeah, examples in Kina, HPV, you guys have already given that. Thank you. Um. Polyvalent from the name polyvalent just has many strains in okay, it's made for immunization of either two or more strains of the same organism 
or two different microbes. We know examples of that. Kwanza there's a common one. And then I've mentioned another one even before. Given to children. Um, yeah, this MMR. The one given to children um, three times DPT. Two different microbes, two or more different microbes. Subunit um, vaccine made by taking a part of the microbe and using the antigenic part using the part that stimulates an immune response. An example is like the hepatitis B or streptococcus pneumonia vaccine. So yeah, we've answered that one. Dead vaccine. Uh, 33, uh, major effector immune cells involved in type 4 hypersensitivity reactions are B lymphocytes, activated macrophages, 5 hydroxytryptamine, complement components, antibodies. Um, could you guys give an answer before we discuss it? Yeah, activated macrophages. So I think we need to discuss like the hypersensitivity reactions really fast. Just summar just a summary. Um, let's start with what's the formula? It's acid. So the first one is please someone type it really fast. Yeah, Ig mediated or allergen mediated. Um, so if it's Ig mediated, the one that involves allergies, uh, basically Ig mediated binds mast cells and basophils, then they cause a release of histamine. Mind you, this is on the second exposure. For the first exposure, that's when you sensitize the mast cells. And then when you uh, expose yourself to the allergen again, that's when the mast cells degranulate and release histamine. So examples, can you guys name examples of type one hypersensitivity reaction? Mm -hmm. Atopy, asthma. Yeah, yeah, allergic rhinitis, yes. So we go to type two now, acid C. Yeah, also pollen, thank you. Um, C, cytotoxic. So here the mechanism is antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So basically there's destruction of cells by antibodies. No, not yet. I don't like using complex there because my formula, it's acid. I think you just understand when I get to the I part. Um, so here we use uh, cytotoxic cells, destruction of cells by antibodies. So the antibody binds to the cell surface antigen, and then you activate complement. So basically you use antibodies sana sana. And if you look at the... Oh, Okay, I'll write the formula in the group. Um, let's use examples. For example, give examples of type two hypersensitivity reactions. Like, like, um, uh huh. Yeah, hemolytic reaction, hemolytic anemia. That's antibodies against RBCs. You see, antibodies are the ones causing cytotoxicity. Another one, like antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor. Another one, like, yeah, yeah. Thank you, rheumatic fever. 
Uh, but I feel like rheumatic fever. Okay, not sure about that one. Graves disease, yes. Antibodies against the TSH receptor. Good pasture syndrome. Antibodies against the basement membrane of kidneys and lungs. Transfusion reaction. I have not seen that. Sorry. That's also there. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, that's done. Now we go to type three. I, immune complex reactions. That's why I never wanted to use complex in two cousins. You said A is allergen, IgE mediated. C is cellular cytotoxicity. So antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity and also complement. And then I is immune mediated, immune complex reactions. So antigen antibody binds, they form antibody antigen complexes. Then these complexes go and deposit themselves in tissues. And then occurrence of inflammatory reactions in those tissues. So examples, can you guys give examples? Yes, vasculitis. SLE, yes. Rheumatoid arthritis, yes. Serum sickness. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Then we go to type four, delayed. Delayed reactions, 24 to 48 hours. So I feel like if you know why it's delayed, you'll know the cells that are usually uh, active there. So it's delayed because, okay, the cells that are active, but the type 4 is cell mediated. Cells that are active are like macrophages and T cells. So the reason why it's mediated, it's delayed, sorry, is because it takes time for the macrophages and the T cells to get to the site of the foreign antigen. So knowing that, now we know why it's delayed and we know that the cells that are affect, that are used are macrophages and T cells, also natural killer cells. And the T cells that are used are cytotoxic T cells. So basically there's activation of T cells which release cytokines and recruit other immune cells to the site of um, infection, to the site of the antigen, why it is. So can you guys give examples of type four? Mm, tuberculin test, contact dermatitis, yes, SJS, chronic graft rejection, yes. Yeah, thanks. So we've discussed now hypersensitivity reactions. Thanks. Okay. Oh my days, Aki time is moving. Um, 41. So the process that synergistically enhanced that is synergistically enhanced by binding of both antibodies and complement fragments such as C3B by phagocytosis is known as neutralization, complement activation, agglutination, opsonization, precipitin reaction. Can you guys give an answer? Yes, D. It's opsonization. So basically, um, Enhanced by binding of both antibodies and complement fa fragments, such as C3B by phagocytosis. So what is an opsonin? An opsonin, give, examples of opsonins are these antibodies and complement fragments. The specific antibody that we're talking about is, does anyone know? IgG. IgG, 
FC receptor portion, not FAB, not FAB, FC receptor portion. And complement fragments, this can be C3B or also C4B, but mainly C3B. That's why that's like a key component of the question. That's how we're getting the answer. And opsonization is basically binding of an opsoning to a target microbe and altering its surface so that there can be efficient phagocytosis. Neutralization is the ability of antibodies to block the sites on bacteria or viruses uh, that they use to like enter cells or they bind in a manner, basically antibodies bind in a manner that blocks infection. How do you block infection? You block uncoating of the viral genome by binding to the viral capsid, or you bind and block a receptor. That's how you neutralize, like, that's how neutralization works. Agglutination, we know this is clamping when an antibody simultaneously binds multiple antigens, and then you get clamping. And precipitation, precipitating reaction is basically precipitation, where you get a soluble antigen and a soluble antibody, they react and they form an insoluble precipitate. So the answer is D. Then we go to OT4. Uh, the major effector molecules involved in type 4 hypersensitivity reactions are, we mentioned them. Does anyone want to give us an answer? We see it A, allergen, IgE. C, complement, so antibodies and complement. I is immune complex reaction, so antigen, antibody complexes. So D, delayed macrophages, um, T cells, I also mentioned, uh, natural killer cells and cytokines. So the answer is A. Yeah, 48. So an example of clinical application of indirect immunofluorescence, diagnosis of bullas, pemphigoid, a demonstration of circulating immunoglobulins. You guys can be writing the answer in the chat. Um, immunoglobulins in pussy immune vasculitis, detection of amyloid light chains, immunoglobulin G deposits in membranous nephropathy, anchor-related crescentic uh, glomerulonephritis. Does anyone know the answer? Yes, A, thank you. Diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid. So uh, basically immunofluorescence uh, can be direct My, or indirect. It can be direct or indirect. So direct, I feel like it's like the principle of ELISA. I don't see it like that, but you have an antigen and you introduce an for direct now you introduce an antibody that already has a dye to it a fluorophore so it uses a dye conjugated antibody to detect the target protein to stain the target protein then you illuminate it and you see it fluoresce whatever <laughs> that term to light up then in indirect it involves first you have the antigen, then you introduce a primary antibody to the target. Okay, so the primary antibody isn't conjugated with anything. It doesn't have anything added to it. You detect the, you detect the antigen using that. So we'll call that the primary antibody, the first antibody you add. Then you add another antibody that now will detect that antibody that you added, Kitambo. So you have antigen, 
you add a primary antibody, then you add another antibody to detect the antibody you had put before. Now that one will have a fluorophore, the second one will be conjugated with a dye. And that is the one that will be the, now that, that's how you'll see the nini, the light, like from the dye, you'll see that fluorescence from it. And um, indirect immunofluorescence is better because like it's, it has a higher sensitivity uh, it's one that is mostly used actually. So yeah, that's one of the functions of indirect immunofluorescence. The others, there are many, but basically it involves PEM figures. I, I saw from like the examples that are given, anything that has PEM figures, PEM figoid is detected using indirect immunofluorescence. Direct, now direct immunofluorescence is used in the diagnosis of suspected autoimmune diseases, uh, connective tissue diseases, and vasculitis. So autoimmune diseases, connective tissue diseases, and vasculitis use direct. Hi, I'm 50. If you haven't understood, um, I can repeat, no problem. Then 50, an individual is given therapy with human immunoglobulin, which of the following conditions would be appropriate for this type of therapy? Superficial bladder cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, agammaglobulinemia, allergy, SLE. Yeah, it's agammaglobulinemia. Agammaglobulinemia, you don't have B cells, meaning, and B cells are the ones that produce plasma cells, and then plasma cells produce immunoglobulins. So you don't have immunoglobulins. So you give uh, immunoglobulins because you don't have them. Are you making sense? Yeah. So the answer is C. Thank you. Uh, 53. The reactive protein is a plasma protein that is elevated during inflammation and infections. C-reactive protein falls into the full link category. Yes, thank you. E, acute phase proteins. Um, other examples of acute phase proteins are like, can you guys give examples? Mm-hmm. Yeah, CRP. Uh-huh. Haptoglobins. Serum amyloid A protein. Yeah. Yes, fibrinogen. Alpha one glycoprotein as well. Yeah, hepcidin. Yeah, thanks. So let's go to 50, 54. Uh, protein extraction is a prerequisite for the fully molecular techniques. So uh, southern blood technique, western blood technique, complementary genomic analysis, in situ hybridization, PCR technique. Yeah, the answer is B. Uh, thank you. Uh, western blood technique. So for here, for this question, I feel like you guys need to know the steps in these various, these various techniques here. So let's start with southern blood, because basically if we discuss western blood, it's like we discussed southern blood. Um, southern blood, what does it test for? What does it look for? I usually use Southern Sudan. Yes, DNA. I use Southern Sudan because Sudan DNA, they kind of look the same to me. So Southern Sudan DNA. Um, Western blood, we've already said proteins. It looks for 
proteins. Northern, northern blot. Yes, thank you, Arini. Eastern. Post translational modifications. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. If you know that, then you need to know the technique that is used in Western blot. And usually five steps. Uh, I feel like we'll discuss this question, like now the techniques in the sports. I feel like there's a question regarding that, but I can go through it, Juju. So Western blot, first there's protein separation, then protein transfer, then blocking, antibody probing, detection. Just that. Um, I feel like we'll discuss it better in the spot, so I won't get into it so that we save time. Um, in situ hybridization, um, I need to discuss this because we have another question regarding it. Um, so in in situ hybridization, what is in situ hybridization? Does anyone know or do I just, let me just say it, save time. Um, you ask yourself two questions. No, before you ask yourself questions, what is in situ hybridization? It's basically trying to locate specific DNA or mRNA or RNA uh, gene alterations in a sample. So you're trying to locate DNA or RNA uh, alterations in a sample. So you ask yourself two questions. Is there any RNA or DNA in this sample that has been altered and where is it? So we need to know the presence and we need to know the location. So for the process, first you treat the sample with a protease. You get your sample, the tissue menetava. Then you treat the sample with a protease. Why are we treating with a protease? Because you want to kill the unwanted proteins since we're looking for something specific. You want to kill the rest. And then number two, probe hybridization. So you add a probe, a probe like a primer with an antigen. The probe will detect the region with the DNA or mRNA. Let's use mRNA in this case. The probe will detect the region with the mRNA and it will attach. The enzyme will come now next. Um, you add an enzyme-linked antibody so that it, attach it attaches to the antigen on the probe. Remember in step two, we added a probe that has an antigen. So now step three, we add an enzyme-linked antibody that will attach to the antigen. And then step four, you add a substrate specific to the enzyme that is linked to the antibody. So I feel like it's basically like an ELISA test. You add probe with an antigen. You add an antibody linked with an enzyme. Then you add a substrate that, can, that is specific to the enzyme. So that, that reaction will release a color, and now you observe the color. If the color is there, it means there's that specific gene alteration that you're looking for. The probe can also be conjugated with an... Um, the last part, uh, you add an enzyme, or let me just start from, you add an enzyme, add a probe with an antigen, then you add an enzyme-linked antibody that will react with the antigen on the probe. Then you add a substrate specific to the enzyme. So antigen on the probe, you add an enzyme-linked antibody, so antibody will react with the antigen. And then you add a substrate specific to that enzyme that you added upon step three. So, no, I don't have a diagram, but I think I have notes on that. I'll also add, I'll also send that as well. So I've noted everything I'm supposed to send. Um, oh, so that we, no, I don't have a diagram, honestly. I just have a mini, my notes which I can send, is that okay? Yes, it's okay. 
Um, yeah, I think you have to know what you're looking for because you're looking for specific de uh, gene alterations. Mm. So, yeah, then you add a substrate specific to the enzyme. And then now when you add the, the enzyme and the substrate will react and it will produce a color. So now that color is what will signify that there is an alteration somewhere. So now you have the presence and you have the location. The probe, I was saying the probe can also be conjugated with an immunofluorescent antibody. And that's how you create like fish, that, that, that what's it called? Acronym fish, fluorescent immuno, uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Now when the probe has been conjugated with an immunofluorescent antibody. Then PCR, we know PCR. Uh, steps of PCR, you guys can name that. The, uh, yeah, denaturation, uh -huh. after denaturation, annealing, yes. So in denaturation, you're basically heating it to, I guess, 94 degrees, I'm not sure, so that you separate the two DNA strands, the double-stranded DNA, now it becomes single-stranded DNA. And then in annealing, you add primers. Then elongation is basically the polymerase working in 5-3 direction. So yeah, uh, let's go to 57. I'm really trying to summarize all these things, but basically, I hope you guys understand it. A 24-year-old male presents with fever, cough, night sweats. Examination reveals elevated temperature, increased respiratory rate, oral crash, and decreased breath sounds in the right mid-lung field. Lab testing reveals a CD4 count of 60 microliters, reference range being 400 microliters. Then on the basis of these findings, the most likely underlying process is so we need to separate the symptoms and the examination findings and also that important bit about the CD4. But you can be writing what you guys think it is. Uh, so symptoms, fever, cough, night sweats. We're already thinking TB, right? And then uh, elevated temperature is just supporting the fever. Um, Increase respiratory rate because you're having difficulty in breathing. Oral thrush, you know, like TB usually has this. Yeah, yeah. And then because of the CD4 count being low, below 200 even, that's AIDS. So the answer is B, HIV AIDS with possible mycobacterium tuberculosis. Then 58, ah, is 58 mine? Characteristic feature of hyperacute B cell mediated renal allograft rejection. You know, we can answer this because we know characteristics of hyperacute uh, rejection. What does it cause? Thrombosis. I told you guys thrombosis and ischemic necrosis. Of graft vessels, thrombosis of graft vessels and ischemic necrosis. Chronic is the one that causes fibrosis. So, regarding if you have that information, yeah, thank you. The answer is D, glomerular thrombotic microangiopathy. So, 60, uh, which of the following is a marker of natural killer cells? What do you guys think? Yeah, it's E. Um, I was saying um I was saying hyperacute causes Mimi, what does it cause? <laughs> um ischemic necrosis and necrosis, ischemic necrosis 
and thrombosis of graft vessels. Yeah. So 60, uh, choice E, yeah. It's E, CD16, and also CD56. That's for natural killer cells. And then we go to other choices. CD20 and CD19, let's group them together. That's for what? CD20, CD19. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, it is B cells. Um, CD5. Okay, let me group it the way I know. Yes, thank you, T cells. So, pan T cells, you have the prime numbers. Two, three, five, seven. That's for pan T cells. Now, T cell subset is the one that we know. CD4, CD8. So pan T cells, two, three, five, seven. Then sub T cell subset, four and eight. Yeah, that's under flow cytometry. You get all those values there. Then 63. Neat. Um, extracellular bacteria are optimally killed by antibody, macrophages plus complement, macrophages, macrophages plus antibodies plus complement, and complement. What do you guys think? Yeah. Thank you, D. Oh, <laughs> no, nah, I'm not asking CD63. Um, yeah, macrophages plus antibody plus complement cause extracellular bacteria usually killed by humoral immunity and also in its system. In the humoral immunity component, we have B lymphocytes and antibodies. Yeah, then in the innate system, we have phagocytic cells dendritic cells, natural killer cells, complement, cytokines. They can basically just listing the components of the innate immune system, innate immune system. So extracellular are killed by those. Intracellular and cell mediated. So yeah, the answer is macrophages plus antibody plus complement. Then we go to 65. Which of the following is a non-organ specific systemic autoimmune disease? Would like to try. Yeah, C, thanks. Yeah, SLE. Um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which organ does it affect? The thyroid, yeah, what happens is you get destruction of the thyroid gland, autoimmune uh, auto antibodies to the thyroid gland. So initially, you get like hyperthyroidism because like other compensation because you're destroying the thyroid hormone, the thyroid gland, so there's less thyroid hormone. So the body compensates for that. But then as you continue increasing those auto antibodies, you destroy the thyroid gland. So now you get you can't compensate for it. So now you get hypothyroidism. And then myasthenia gravis, it affects the skeletal muscles. Um, Insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Yeah, punctures. What do you mean by A? Um, pernicious anemia. Oh, answer is B, mesnia gravis. 
Ah, SLE, 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 and says SLE. Um, pernicious anemia, mucosal lining of the stomach and nerves. Then sixty-seven. In inflammation of the mucosa, the response. Anyone? Actually, I I know the answer, but I don't know how to explain it to you guys. But let's just see. What do you guys think? Yeah, to help us 17. I haven't, let me be honest with you guys, I haven't really researched on it, so I don't want to like give you guys false information. So if anyone knows the explanation, please type it in the chat box. Thank you. Then we'll get back to it. Let's go to 68 for now, because of time. But then say is T helper 17. Um, 68, a 20-year-old male presents in the emergency room with a lymphoma involving the mediastinum that is producing respiratory distress. The lymphocytes are most likely to have cell surface markers characteristic of which of the following. Uh, T lymphocytes, dendritic reticulum cells, macrophages, B lymphocytes, Langerhans cells. Guys, answers. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now you have different answers. I love you. Um, why do you guys think it's A? I wasn't even going with A. I'm going with D. B lymphocytes. Anyone who's going with A who can support the answer? Let me try and support mine. So lymphoma involving the mediastinum. So which lymphomas involve the mediastinum? We have Hodgkin's um, primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. It's a subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and we have T lymphoblastic lymphoma. So I disqualified A because if at all it's going to involve the mediastinum, it's going to be a T lymphoblastic. So the T lymphoblasts will be increased. That was eliminating A. And I went with B because the rest are primarily B cell lymphomas. I said, um, when you check lymphomas involving the mediastinum, uh, we have Hodgkin's lymphoma, we have primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, which is a subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and we have T lymphoblastic lymphoma. So, I disqualified A because uh, if at all it's going to be involving the T cells, it's going to be a T lymphoblastic lymphoma, according to my research. <coughs> yeah. Then the other ones, Hodgkin's and primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, are primarily B cell lymphomas. So that's why I was going with B lymphocytes. I hope, but if anyone who's supporting A can support the answer, feel free, it's a free world. Um, let's go to 73. So a medical student develops an erythematous indurated and blistering skin rash on his hands on his second week of clinical rotations, 
The dermatologist suspects that this could have been caused by latex gloves, which are the ruling represents a likely step in the pathogenesis of these skin lesions. So what do you guys think this sensitivity is? Like which hypersensitivity is it? Mm D. Mm -hmm. Type one. Mm hmm You know, I was actually going with delayed. Yeah, I was going with type four. It was a bit like, I was leaning towards type one at first, but then I thought about the question. Yeah, uh, keyword, second week of his clinical rotations. What happens in the rotations? Usually wear gloves all the time. So... I was disqualifying type 1 because type 1 usually happens even in minutes or hours upon the second exposure to the allergen. So if you're assuming that this guy was wearing uh, gloves the whole week, why is it that it happened during the second week? It could have happened like the second time he was wearing the gloves. So I went with type 4 hypersensitivity so that we say it just delayed but does that make sense because a characteristic of type 1 is that it happens in minutes or hours uh, after exposure to the allergen yeah so type 4 hypersensitivity the path with the pathogenesis Antigen presentation, the MHC class 2 pathway. Yeah, because a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction is caused when CD4 T helper 1 cells recognize foreign antigen in a complex with MHC class 2. So you have the What do you mean by topical kind of allergic reaction? Okay, for it to be an allergic reaction, See, we say that it has to occur in the second exposure. We can also say this is contact dermatitis. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was going with A, antigen presentation by the MHC class 2 pathway. So, we reach 80 or um, 77. Ah, this is nice, Hata. Um, antibodies, 77. Guy needs... <laughs> Just two more questions, and they're easy. Um, antibodies made in the spleen that are directed against the cell surface antigens, glycoprotein 2B uh, slash 3A, or glycoprotein 1B uh, stupo, are characteristically seen in individuals with, what do you guys think? Yeah, ITP. Uh, yeah, these glycoproteins, you remember you saw them in pharmacology when we're talking about antiplatelet agents and their mechanisms. So these are platelet glycoproteins. So antibodies to these platelets will cause thrombocytopenia. So immune, thrombo immune thrombocytopenic fibula, that's the answer. Then 78, the last one, which of the following cytokines is a central mediator of septic shock? Um, guys, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Tumor necrosis factor alpha and also interleukin 1 is also there. So, D. Yeah, 